This is Hope White of HD Dredge and Container Services, and you're now watching Truck and Hustle. All right, Hustle Fam, Hustle Fam, we are back with another amazing episode. And today I have a friend to the show. Yes, right. This is the three P. Three P. This is the three P. Come on with it. The, I, you might be the first three P. Shut up. I, <laughs> oh, you know I love to be the first. <laughs> I think you are the first three P. Welcome wow. back to Truck and Hustle Hope. White. Thank you so much, my man. I'm so excited. Are you serious? The first three P? I swear to you, you're, <sighs> you're the first three P. There, there's been several people have been on twice, yeah. but you're the first person been on three times. Oh, so congratulations for oh. being the first three P. I love it. Salute. 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 So when we get together, it's always a good time. Yeah. It's always fun. We always have great conversation. Yeah. We always drop tons of value, Absolutely. tons of knowledge, yeah. and we make yeah. sure that the audience leaves better than they came, right? Yeah. So we're going to do that today again. Okay. Um, but I want to I wanna take this time to kind of like reintroduce you again to our audience because we've grown a lot yeah. as a channel, you yeah. know, since we, you know, first connected. Yeah. So there may be, may be people who are seeing this and don't know your story and your story is amazing. So I want to take the time to kind of go back through that a little bit yeah. and just kind of get into who you are. So, so first to put context around it, just tell the audience who you are yeah. and just what you do about your business. Sure, okay. sure. So I'm Hope White, CEO of HD Dredge, <laughs> HD Dredge and Container Services, uh, formerly HD White Logistics. That's when you met me. Yeah. Um, we do container storage and dredge services out of Savannah, Charleston, and Jacksonville Market. Um, and we also are asset based, so we have seven trucks, seven drivers, and about 15 staff. I've been in the business now since 2014, formerly corporate exec. Um, transportation, uh, trans, uh, in the DC setting. Um, left that, started my own entity, started off as a brokerage with HD White Logistics, and then pivoted um, in June 2020 to HD Dredge and Container Services. Got it, got it. Okay, so we said a lot. Mm -hmm. We, we, we kind of covered, covered everything. Yeah. Um, so when we first connected, <clears throat> Everybody's excited about the freight brokerage portion yeah. of your business, right? And you've since pivoted and, and built your business yeah. on top of that, yeah. right? So let's kind of go back there and, and, and let's talk about that because you come from corporate, sure. right? Corporate background. Sure. Let's talk about that 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 transition to how that kind of happened for you. Yeah, so coming out of supply chain, um, first I was in trans, um, D.C. level, and I said corporate exec, but it was more so feel uh, attached to corporate um, SSC, but... We did a lot of uh, e-commerce for Home Depot. That was our facility. Um, and so there we managed um, uh, care relations on the dry van side, more, more specifically. Um, working a lot of hours, 17-hour days, uh, doing vendor management, um, inbound, outbound, EDI compliance, things I've always talked about on your show. Right, right, right. Um, but after about four years of that, I got burnt out. Um, and I need to do something different. And so my husband started a trucking company and I essentially started dispatching him, which most women do <laughs> or most partners do. I won't say women, but most partners do there start dispatching their partners, just trying to assist them grow their business. Um, while doing that, I realized that a lot of what he was doing was what I was doing at work and just wanted to figure out how I could scale and grow from there. And the answer was becoming a freight broker. Got it. So getting into that that role uh, with Home Depot, how, how'd you even get there? L did you go to school for that? No. No, you didn't, uh, <laughs> right? You kind of just like fell into that. Yeah, job, I like right? fell into it. So my previous background, a lot of people don't know this. I was in law enforcement for seven years. Oh, you were cop. Yeah, I was gang task force. Kick gang task? Kick ta your dough in. Stop playing. I ain't playing. I didn't know that. I never told you that. You Hold on. You was a, a whole First cop. woman in, last man out. Nah. Don't play. For real? <laughs> Yes. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So that was your first career was a That cop? was my first career was uh, law enforcement from 2007 to 2013. So did you like study like criminal justice or something in college or something No, like that? I just wanted to be a police officer. You just want to be a police officer? Yeah. All right, so when, what, what age were you when you became a police officer? Uh, 23, 24, 24. And you started like on the gang Task force? Yeah. No, I started in basic patrol. Okay. So, like, I was on patrol for, like, eight months, and I was not your typical patrol officer, because <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I used to go looking for trouble. Okay? I went- Why did I, why did I have- I had a feeling that that was I the case. I went looking for the action. 
vacation, okay? Right. Why, why do this job and not get paid for it? Hold on. So what, what city are you in when you're doing this? I was in Albany. Albany, New York? Albany, Georgia. Albany, Georgia. Okay. All right. I didn't want to say Albany. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried to say Albany. Okay. Okay. Albany. Albany. So you're in Albany, Georgia. Yeah. You're 24 years old. Yeah. And you're and you're a police officer. And I'm a police officer. All right. And when right. you're looking for trouble. And I'm looking for trouble. Right. And Talk when I say you. looking for trouble, like you need I'm, some excitement. Yeah, I'm looking for you to run. I'm looking for you to run the stop sign. <laughs> I'm looking for you know pull up on the spot. Like, hey, what y'all got going on? If you take off running, I like running. Right. Right. And so you said I did that, and after about eight months, um, one of my captains approached me about becoming intel. On gang task force okay intel officer so i immediately accepted and i was one uh the only female of a 12 male unit how was that uh a lot yeah yeah it was very intense yeah because I, I felt like i always had to be very masculine to keep up it was kind of very hard for me to be feminine so i'm sure you've seen a lot oh yeah during that time yeah absolutely absolutely seen a, what's a like lot. the craziest thing you you experienced during your time at on the gang task force um i think the craziest time was watching our youth um pool and create all these different gangs and organizations just to fit in and only to watch them pass away years later mm. like they you know very young ages 16. so like people we were mentoring and try to guide and keep from doing certain things you would be going to their funeral or hearing about their funeral or their shooting, working their shooting maybe a year later. So the goal of the gang task force was to kind of disperse the gangs. Mm -hmm. So on a regular basis, you guys would kind of like, like, were you like going, confronting them? And yeah, it's called community oriented policing. It's where the law enforcement is involved in the community and we're providing resources and information, uh, mentoring the youth, like trying to get them to do a different path and just like showing them a different way. Now, it's not always about arresting, right? Um, but more so about serving the community and helping those get those resources that they need. So that was the goal of our gang task force in Albany at that time. Got it. So mm -hmm. you guys are there to help. Yeah. Truthfully. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Wow. That, but when you come in as what they say, twelve. Yeah. In uniform. You met. Not, you met with that. Uh, it's not always received. that resistance. Yes, and it was not just the the kids themselves, but their parents as well, because you remember it's a mentality that's kind of fostered in some in some sense, and so we were met with a lot of different uh, emotions there. Got it. So yeah. th there's a there's a lot of different type of gangs, or is it like one or two gangs. Oh yeah. So Albany is not that big in, right. in in comparison to Albany, New York, of course. But surprisingly, at that time, there were like over 150 gangs. Get out of here. 150 yeah. gangs. Yeah, because to assemble, all you gotta have is you know colors, you know membership, you know like initiative, and y'all commit a crime, and now you're a gang. Yeah. 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 Wow. Okay. So you you did you did that for how long? Yeah, I did that for seven years. Seven years. Mm -hmm. And then what made you get out of that field? Um, well, I did gang task force for about two years. Okay. Um, but I got out of law enforcement altogether because I had small children, two girls at the time. Yeah. And it was just getting out of hand. You kind of see the news now, what's going on. That is nothing that has not been going on for a while. Right. Um, a lot of the law enforcement shootings. Um, and so crime kind of was elevating, and I just kind of got tired of the action. I was like, you know, the police officer funeral is not worth yeah. my life. Yeah, Because yeah, yeah. all my kids will get is $25,000 and a flag. Right. No. Got it. Mm -hmm. Got it. So when you decide to leave, how, how do you? How does that work? You just get in, well, go in there one day, say, I'm done? Or? Oh, I said, I'm going to holler at y'all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I actually had transitioned into, like, um, I moved back home. I went through something really personal, and so I went moved back home to my family. <clears throat> to live with my family and there I was kind of policing at a smaller law enforcement entity mm -hmm. their name shall remain unnamed okay um and so while there um it was such a small rural town that one of my sergeants kept calling me gal 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 like girl like gal g-a-l it's a southern thing but like girl though like I was in the field Gal. Yeah, got mm -hmm. you and got I you. said if he called me gal one more time I'm going in got it so rather than do that I quit Okay. I said, this is my exit now. Okay. But that that same day that I said I was going to quit, I had also gotten into an altercation with a young 14-year-old male where he tore up my boots. <laughs> I ran out of my uniform. What? And so I was like, okay, this is this is it. <laughs> oh, no. He, he chased you out your boots? Yeah, he chased me. <laughs> 
really chased me in my boots. And I was like, okay, this is it. I'm done. This is all. Oh, but you're supposed to be law enforcement. You're supposed to be chasing him. Look at <laughs> Once I came out my boots and I had one boot on and he had one handcuff and we was going across six lanes of traffic. What? Party's over. I'm done. So was this like a like? Did you confront him at first and then like? Oh, I was he, making arrests. He's making arrests. Arrest. He wasn't having it. That no, day. he fought. And, and he was 14. He was 14, <laughs> and I was 30, and I was like, "Listen, You're right, bruh." That was when keeping it real goes wrong. Yeah, right? <laughs> and it was at that moment. <laughs> it was at that moment, she knew she. Fought. I knew. I was <laughs> That 14-year-old gave yeah. me a run for my you know, money. It's so you funny. Me? I'm just like trying to visualize this <laughs> little young little boy. And he was on the front of the car. Now, you know, some 14-year-old, they kind of cornbread fed, right? And so he like whipped around, and when he snatched, and I tried to grab him, honey, that thing took cross, and my boot came loose. Well, I was like, oh, listen, I'm out. Oh, that is I'm gonna so take them, funny. I'm going to take them their gun today. That is so funny. Yeah. All right. So you realize that maybe law enforcement isn't for you. Isn't for me. And so I transitioned into, I started working part-time job at Home Depot anyway. Okay. I had already started doing that to kind of make some extra money. Okay. Um, and from there, kind of asked some friends and family about growing, and the opportunity came available to work in the DFC in McDonough. And you're working Home Depot um, just in like what type of capacity? So I initially started off in the transportation office as an inbound office coordinator. Essentially our role is to receive the trucks in, the paperwork associated with it to help the dock receive the freight off the trucks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. So you start doing that and you start learning logistics. Learning logistics, essentially. Yeah. I grew from there. Um, and then on the dock, I moved into like more vendor compliance. I kind of put myself in role where I became this in all be all see all for all vendor compliance issues. So whether the product could receive into the building accurately to get in, you know, get in uh, inventory or if it was packaged correctly for us to be able to receive it properly, um, just PO issues, anything like that, I became like the corporate contact for that inside without actually being in the office. Okay, yeah. got you. And how many people is in that department? Is it like you and a couple other people? Yeah, or? so in the transportation office, we only had five, five at that time. Pretty small department. Pretty small. Okay, yeah. got you. And so and during this time, how long is it before your husband comes to you with the idea of starting a trucking company? Uh, about a year. Okay, mm -hmm. about a year. Mm -hmm. And obviously, okay, that's cool. Additional income in the house or yeah. whatever. And you, you want to help? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So at what point do you realize that you can be an asset to this business? Um, I actually, after being in transportation for about a year and a half, got pregnant. Okay. Um, and so I ended up having to take a leave of absence. Um, and so while I was on that leave of absence, I started kind of like helping him. Like, mm. oh, what are you doing? You know, more like dispatching him, essentially. Gotcha. Um, and so while I was doing that, I realized that uh, you can make a lot of money real quick. So, like, previously, before my husband was running his own loads and dispatching himself, he was making, like, 5000 6000 We thought that was a lot of money. But then when I took the leave of absence and started helping him, he made, like, ten, twelve thousand dollars mm. $12,000 in a week. Okay. One week. Just what, what was the change? Five days. Just the change was I understood routing, I understood timing, I understood schedule, and I understand communication with the customers. So I could get him to deliver this load, ping him to this next load, all while he was still in his service hours. So I was maximizing his time frame while he was running his loads, and that gotcha. allowed him to increase his profitability. So at this point, it's just one truck and your husband as One a truck and my husband, running hard. Okay, yeah. and you decided to take it to another level yeah, after that? Yeah, after that, um, making, making dispatching was just not enough for me um, because I wanted to kind of see how my skills from Home Depot were transferable. And so then I asked, like, what, what, how do you get to become a broker? Kind of called, like, a family friend. And they were like, oh, you just got to buy it. Buy what? <laughs> <laughs> you ain't got to go to school. You right. ain't got to do no form of education. It was like, no, you got to buy your certification. With who? Right. So I did that. You know, I went through the process, 21 days, had my brokerage authority, and didn't know shit. Got it. Don't know if I can say shit, but. Oh, you can. It's too late. It's too All late. Right, it's out there. We ain't edited it out either. Yeah. And so <laughs> I didn't know shit. And so I started, like, researching from there. From that point, it was, like, April of 2017. And so from that point, I just kind of, like, just stalled out because I didn't know what to do. I had this corporate job still and got this brokerage authority and I went and bought this website and got this, you know, logos and shirts and all that and nobody's talking to me. I don't know what to do. Right. So I took a brokerage class. Got you. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. So you went, 
Edu- invested in yourself. Invested in my education. How, how much did that help? Twenty two hundred dollars. Okay. Best twenty two hundred dollars I ever spent. Really? Yeah. She, the young lady, she's phenomenal. I don't want to take anything from her, but the program actually just helped me put together the pieces from Home Depot to actually the entrepreneurial side of what I needed to do. Made the connection. Made the connection. From there, I shot off. Got you. Yeah. So, what was it that connected? Right? Like, what was it that that you like once you saw the uh like i guess the you, customer she, side yeah she, the customer side and then yeah. you saw the other side like how did you put those pieces together to where you were like you know i got it this yeah, is yeah so for me it helped me put together the processes um by which what customers needed and that how that conversation needed to be had so in her course she talked about marketing your business and strategy and sales prospecting which is very essential in brokerage and so i kind of understood and went back to my from being a corporate, uh, when people would call me and ask me about loads, what would they say and what would be my response? That's why I always tell my mentees, stop calling, cold calling people because that's not way we would respond. We would respond in email. Mm. So then I started crafting emails from there, from marketing and sales, to yield better results for responses with customers. And that's how I started getting responses because that was the way that I responded to Curious when they wanted to do business with us. Got it. So what was the first opportunity? Kroger. Kroger. Yeah, Forest Park. How did that opportunity come about? Um, I sent an email um, to the Kroger team there, uh, the D.C., and she immediately responded and asked me to come do a meeting. I came up and did a meeting at the warehouse. Um, I was sweating. <laughs> um, I, and here's the other thing. I showed up to this meeting jazzy. You know what jazzy means? I think I do, but explain. It's an old school term. Okay. Clean as cat shit. Got it. Okay, I went up there with seven inch heels on and, and patting these pants, dress pants and a blazer. And that lady was just like with some tennis shoes and a t shirt <laughs> and some jeans. I said that it's very important to understand where you're going in your environment. You mm. get what I'm saying? Of course, you want to put your best foot forward, but you also want to be. But she was, ne- nevertheless, she was very impressed. Yeah. Um, I met with her and told her who we were explain who HD White Logistics was at the time, what we can offer her, and which market we covered. From that conversation, she told me she would get back with us in a week, and then she would let me know. A week came, and I was actually in New Orleans for my birthday, and she contacted me and said, send me 20 trucks, just like that. Mm. Um, She said she was very impressed with my presentation because I understood my core business and how that I was going to be able to assist Kroger in their current demand. Got it. Now, a lot of people, when they get started, will be in your shoes, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? And and you said you you basically let her know what you guys can do, right? right? Like what 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 your strengths were so far, and so right. forth. But you were still new. I was still brand new. So how, you didn't even really know what you could do, right? So your what what is your advice to people who are in that position where they don't have. They, they're not really working with anything yet. They just, right. They're just working with potential. Right. Right. Like, what did you say to her to, 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 for, to make her believe in you? So I leaned into my skill set, which is communication and the ability to provide effective communication. So I let her know that, you know, of course, I was experienced in supply chain. So for those that may not be experienced in supply chain, what are you experiencing? in? Is communication is an IT. So you speak to your systems or whatever it is. Um, so I leaned into the communication piece of it. Um, and then I also let her know that we were a new entity and I was looking to partner with her and hope that they would grow us. I was very honest with that. That's important, mm-hmm. right? Because I was going to ask you, were you transparent with, with the fact that you got, you're just getting started, right? Because yeah. a lot of people feel like they got to fake it yeah. till they make it. No, that can get you in a sling. Get your ass in a big sling. Yeah. Because you'll essentially commit to work that you're not actually prepared for. So I say be fully transparent and honest about where you are. All they can say is no. That means it's not the right yes for you. Right. Mm-hmm. So she was okay with the fact that you guys were new and, right. and, and your goals right. to grow with them. Right. So she calls you. She says, I need 20 Send trucks. me 20 trucks. Okay. I can't send you shit because <laughs> I'm in New Orleans. <laughs> my computer in Atlanta. Right, right, right. Okay. And I don't know nobody's name off the top of my head. Right. So I essentially picked up the phone and started calling my husband's family members. And, of course, it was like on a Friday, so they out of service hours. Nobody can come. And it was just like a big mess. Mm. And so she kept calling me all Friday like, hey, where your trucks at? Nobody's here yet. And I didn't want to tell her I don't have these trucks. So I just kind of like panicked on the inside. So I just kept saying, we'll send somebody, we'll send somebody. And then finally my strength came and said, be business minded. 
speak the truth, speak what's going on. So I picked up the phone. I called. I said, hey, how you doing? I'm sorry. Um, I am out of town, and I do not have my computer with me at this moment. I'm not, you know, right in front of my contacts. But could you allow me to Monday to send those trucks to you? And she said, yeah, girl, no problem. She mm. said, thank you for letting me know. So we went, we'll take you off the board. I said, okay, thank you. Gotcha. And so Monday came, I sent 40. You sent 40? Mm, I wasn't playing. Got it. Mm-hmm. How do we get 40? You couldn't find 20 before, but you oh, no, no. Find 40. I, I didn't have my computer. So you did have the contacts. I had a network, yeah. So when I started working with my husband and dispatching him, um, it's all about communication. So I started talking guys up, um, talking to like a lot of guys my husband met at the truck stop. I went to the truck stops, put signage out, handed out cards. Like I had met a lot of guys. And I ain't hard on the ass, baby. So <laughs> they'll talk to me. No doubt. Okay. No so doubt. I, I built a lot of relationships. Um, with a lot of different trucking companies. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, got it. So you were able to send 40 trucks. How yeah. did you know, still being new, um, how did you know how to price those moves? The pricing. So this particular client, you don't give them your price, and they give you their pricing. Mm. So we were had to work with what was set with them. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was more than enough. It was more than enough. What, mm-hmm. what were the margins on it? Do you remember? Oh, yeah. My margin at that time was like 35%. 35%. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. Got yeah. it. Yeah. All right. So that happens. And then what happens after that? GTT Commercial Tires is a tire store that's designed with the owner operator in mind. It serves as a helpful community where you are always their number one priority. Whether you're a new owner operator or you've been driving for years, their mission is the same to keep owner operators in business. That's why they go above and beyond providing superior customer service when you actually need it, educating you on proper tire care and delivering a no BS sales experience. With two conveniently located stores in Richmond and Petersburg, Virginia, and almost 2,000 five star Google reviews, they are truly raising the bar and setting a new standard in tire care. Make sure you call 1 800 991 6251 to schedule your appointment now and tell them Truck and Hustle sent you. Yeah, so <laughs> after that, we did, we just like shot off. Like, we just killed it. Like, we went from like $0 to like 680 quick boom with with kroger with kroger okay. now we had like two or three other clients in play as well but kroger was the bulk of our business at that time okay um what, what was it what was happening in kroger at that time that where there was so much capacity that they handed off to you well kroger's a a, a distribution center for groceries so at that time they were doing anywhere from a thousand to sixteen hundred truckloads a day hmm. to all the so they the D, the dc distributes to all the grocery stores in this market Gotcha. Out of the southeast region. Gotcha. So they were doing a heavy, robust, you know, truck services. Kroger Kroger distributes to everybody. They distributes to, to their stores, Kroger's. to their Kroger's, right. and then also their vendors distribute to them. So got you it. got Heinz, um, Hershey's, uh, Pepsi, Budweiser. You're also doing those truckload services for some of those vendors, too, coming to Kroger. Got it. So it's not just one way, just all of Kroger's. It's inbound you, and outbound. Yeah, you're also doing a round trip. Maybe you may go around and pick up some Purina dog food or something like that and come back to the D.C. Okay, yeah. okay. Or Nestle. Got you. So you mm-hmm. start growing with, with, with them. Mm-hmm. Um, how big do you grow working with, with Kroger? Um, I grew from one person to four people in like two, three months. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So pretty quick. Pretty quick. Pretty quick, two, three months. All right, what happens next? We go into recourse. What's that mean? Financial recourse is where we were factoring our loads uh, with Kroger. Um, Now, here's where people need to understand their their business, Mm. okay? I was so gung-ho on getting the business that I had not perfected or even thought about my processes of how we were going to get paid, um, what that looked like. How do you get paid? What type of system do I use to manage my invoices or anything like that? I was just, I want the money. (laughs) So when the money started coming in, I was not paying attention if there were duplications in our invoices, um, if the invoices were even paid accurately. I just didn't care the deposit. The check was depositing. Right. And so um, essentially what ended up happening is there was some duplications. Only four. But that was enough to trigger what's called a recourse. Okay. That recourse, um, the factoring company started backing up on Kroger, like pushing up on them to make payments. And, hey, this is what. And so Kroger shut down all billing with us until there was an internal audit done to figure out where the duplications was coming from. And also 
um, why is TBS saying, I mean, yeah, it was my factoring company. It still is. Um, why is TBS saying um, we're not getting paid? Got it. And so that created a, a recourse. Where were the duplications coming from? Um, I had an office associate at the time that had submitted four loads um, that had already been previously paid. Intentionally or unintentionally? She intentionally submitted it, but the driver intentionally sent it in twice. Got it. Mm-hmm. And we didn't verify. So there was no process to verify if drivers had duplicate, duplicated loads to us, and there was no process in place to see if we had duplicate submitted it to TBS. Right. Mm-hmm. And then that settlement is already done. He, the driver's paid, so yes. can't get that back can't from him, Can't get that right? money. Oh, he was, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, oh, thank you for the extra check. You yeah. Know? Um, so that triggered that recourse, shut our finances down for about three months, had to have an emergency meeting with Kroger. Yeah. Say, hey, listen, and when I'm saying Kroger, let me clarify, it's actually America Logistics, nope. which manages the logistics for, for Kroger. Kroger. Right. right. So we had to have an emergency meeting with America Logistics, and um, I went in there with my boss girl, black girl, Magic hat <laughs> on. <laughs> I'm supply chain one on one. You can't tell me nothing. Where my money at? Right. They was like, we gonna pay you, but when we pay you, we done. Mm. Yeah. So you gonna get what you want, but you, don't, you, you ain't want, gonna get what you need. We don't like the way you handled this at all. Oh wow. And when when looking back in hindsight, 2020, I handled it all wrong. I was more so. Uh, defensive and argumentative because I was so focused on getting the money but not understanding where the error was. Got gotcha. you. And so once So this I, was this is before you discovered what was going on. Before I discovered what was like, going on. Money, I was too I'm busy move, arguing. These loads. Yeah. I know you Yeah, you, I was too busy arguing. Cut my check. Take my money out of reserve. Like right. this my money. Like right. it, I was so focused on that for weeks at a time. Even when the meeting was called, I went in with documentation prepared to argue not understand hmm. so even in the meeting i even when they said it was gonna cut me my check i still had attitude like <laughs> okay you know right and then when they cut the check and all the reserves and everything got released i got back to the house i got back to the office like a couple weeks later and i was sitting down going to everything and it just hit me like a ton of bricks i was like shit hmm. i messed that up right bad all this money that you have been making, all this growth is just done. Done. Just because of kind of like arrogance. Arrogance and not really refining my processes and understanding business first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what did you do after that? Um, so I took some time off. How, how long? Uh, uh, about four or five months. It was a full ego kicker. <laughs> I mean, it kicked me straight in my forehead. Um, and I took maybe a little bit more than that. And I just took time to really like find information and educational resources to help me understand how to run and manage my business better. So I took an, um, a QuickBooks online course. Um, I went to SCORE, which is actually in downtown Atlanta, uh, Small Business Administration SCORE. It's an um, entity inside that helps small business owners under understand uh, management skills within your business, finances, reports, um, sending emails, just different things like that. So okay. I did that because as coming out of corporate, corporate does not teach you how to be a small business owner. It just teaches you how to be corporate and how to do their business, not how to do your business. Right. And so I took time to invest in that. I became part of the UGA uh, Small Business Development Center program, mentorship program. Uh, finish that, just understanding about profit and loss uh, statements uh, and man- different managerial s- styles within your, your business um, and how to manage your employees, grow, and stuff like that. So I just took that time to do that. And then in addition, I started to find a whole shit ton of conferences. Mm. Any free supply chain course that was out there, I found it. And I would get my ass up at 2 a.m. AM in the morning and drive to these conferences. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. So you're investing in yourself, yeah. essentially. Yeah. But you're not making any money. No. And I just kind of leaned on to my husband at that point. I kind of put my business on pause to really, like, focus on growing my business because I felt like the investment that I put in myself would propel me to where I am now. And it right. actually did. So talk about the comeback. Whew. 
<laughs> all right. So, um, and we kind of talked about this before the show started, but um, the comeback was very difficult for me emotionally because my ego had been hurt. Um, my Home Depot prepared me, uh, gave me this big boof ego. I was phenomenal there. I'm st- I still have a lot of contacts, a lot of friends there. And so I was the shit. Yeah. When I come over to my business, I'm not the shit. I'm failing horribly. And nobody's giving me no accolades, no pat on the back, no, hey, this is what you need. I'm just out here on my own. And so um, when I tried to come back, I suffered in communication because I, you could basically hear my insecurities coming out in my email. I wasn't sure of myself. Um, when I would email people, when I would call, I would just kind of take their first answer and be done with it. Um, and so, like, my first real customer coming back is a waffle. Like, they, make, they manufacture um, uh, Ego uh, waffles. I actually, like, begged her on the phone for the opportunity. Really? Yeah. Because I was kind of like... You know, just like down in the dumps. Like trying to, you had in desperation. Yeah, I was in desperation. Yeah, yeah, I was just like really, really messed up. And so she gave me the opportunity, and that was the comeback. And that I really worked on processes with that client. I really took the time to understand communication and the timeliness of communication. And then managing the invoices when they came in, and then managing the growth from there. Like how do how quickly do I add new carriers, and which systems do I need to have? And like I really worked on the process there. Got it. What about the rest of the team? Um, the rest of the team, I only had two people. Okay. I had cut everybody loose. Got you. Yeah. So during that, I mean, like that three month or whatever period, like yeah. they kind of just did what they were doing. Oh, no, no. I froze everybody. I was like, look, effective me, everybody fired. Got like, you. We, I, I, yeah, I ain't doing nothing. Yeah, we ain't doing nothing. So when you came back, two people came back yeah, with you Yeah, two and people got came back with me, and that's what started, yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. so you start working with, the, you said Waffle Company, right? The Waffle Bakers. The Waffle Bakers, mm-hmm. and how does how does that kind of go? Yeah, so she them? gave me an opportunity, and we did a lot of reefer work for her, okay. um, for them, and um, that went very well, um, and then COVID. Mm. Mm-hmm. What happens then? Uh, you don't know what happens. You just try to, <laughs> oh, God, what happens? You know, I had another client um, up in Chambly. We did a lot of moving, a lot of hotel freight for them. That stopped. Everything just kind of stopped. So I was like, well, what do we do next? And so. Um, and where are you at, like, in the business? Like, how, how many, like, how large are you? When COVID hits at this um, point? I'm probably doing about 75 to 100 loads okay. a month. Not okay. that heavy. I'm not that heavy. Gotcha. Yeah, but I'm doing enough to pay the bills. You're, you're right. You're building yeah. back up. I'm paying the bills. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, coming from a conference uh, from Charlotte right before COVID, I think I told you this, I was in traffic and realized the containers. Like, oh, my God, it's containers. That's where the money is. Yeah. When COVID happened, I just was like spitballing. What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And um, I went to a conference in North Georgia. It's called the Georgia Logistics Summit. They have it every year. Registration is open now. If you're inter- interested in dredge, you should probably register and go to the Georgia Logistics Summit. Mm-hmm. Um, I, there, I met representatives from the port and from Candler County Industrial Authority. Um my whole intent of going to that conference was for me to pivot. But when I COVID happened, it allowed me to actually sit down and put together all the relationships. So part of the COVID spitball was container storage and okay. warehousing. Got it. Mm-hmm. So there's a new opportunity now. New opportunity. So I started reaching out to my contacts like, hey, I'm looking at this space. I want to do this. And because of those relationships I had formed, it was like, yeah, come on. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So inevitably you grab this space. Yes. The storage space. Yeah. How many acres? 10.65 acres. How do you finance that? Um, it's actually through the Candler County Industrial Authority. Okay. So whenever you come into a, um, um, a space like that um, and you are bringing jobs and growth to that county, that is an um, an opportunity that's financed and backed more so by the county and the city because they want to help you grow. So the Canlan County, County Industrial Authority has an initiative with small business owners or large business owners to help you grow there. And so okay. that's through them. So can you get into like how, how that works in terms of like, is this a loan? Is this something that... You it's an agreement. To. All right, guys, listen, before we continue the show, I got to give a shout out to our sponsor and our partner, 
OTR Solutions, formerly OTR Capital, but listen guys, OTR is much, much more than just a factoring company. They provide so many solutions to help the small carrier not only get into business, but to stay in business and maintain, right? So you guys have to partner with them and check them out. Don't take my advice for it. Talk to their clients, right? Talk to their clients. Find out what the people are saying. Everybody will tell you the same thing. So make sure you give OTR Solutions a call at 470-900-3338 or click the link in the bio below. Make sure you check them out and tell them Truck and Hustle sent you. It's an agreement? Mm-hmm. Okay. And when you, you're, you're bringing things to the table and they're giving you something back in return. Okay, mm -hmm. so they're able to. So in terms, it's it's like you you're bringing jobs, you're bringing opportunity, you're bringing jobs and, here and growth. Is the, and here is the the, the land, the or land, to do it. the resources, whatever you need to do it. Is this something that anyone could do? Yes, is anybody can do this. How did you? So long, how did you so, know you were able to do this though? I'm very resourceful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very resourceful. So, um, part of going to a lot of these conferences, um. A lot of the resources that we need to do businesses and meetings and rooms that we don't typically go in. So like the commissioner's meetings, uh, the city council's meetings, um, the zoning meetings. In these meetings, you'll learn about when Amazon is coming in. You'll learn about when Walmart is planning on building in D.C. or Starbucks or Chick-fil-A. And so those meetings are not discriminate for small businesses. It's just an opportunity for you to learn to see where you fit in at. Those resources are still available to you, not just because your name is not Amazon, you just gotta make yourself available to it. Okay. And so um, it starts with you creating a business plan, um, understanding where your funding is gonna come from, what your strategy is gonna be, and what your um, value is gonna be to the county. And then you have to approach them. You got to be serious. You can't be John John that just started six trucks and now you want a piece of land. No, no, no. Um, you have to have to have a serious business model. And you also have to have some references that are willing to back you to say, yes, they're solid. They're going to do great business there. So this is zero money down on your end? Damn, Ramon. <laughs> Shit, <laughs> Candler County. Well, I'm sorry. I mean, this is like this is like mind blowing stuff to me. Like this is kind of so. Kinda... I am I am I am very blessed. Um, and very fortunate. I started off with two business partners. You know about that. I can't talk about it too much. Yeah. But I do have. I did start with two business partners. But essentially, it was zero money down. Wow, wow. That that's crazy. Zero money down. How do we not know about these opportunities, man? It's because we don't put ourselves in the spaces where the opportunities are. We're putting ourselves in the spaces that glitter and are glitzy. That's not the spaces. And no knock or no disrespect to anyone who follow those type spaces. But that's not where the true opportunities are. It's in the spaces that make you uncomfortable. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. For right. sure. Right. Okay. So... Blessed with a huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, how do we go about monetizing this space now to get started? So let me and let me go back really quickly. In Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, and northern Florida, there are several counties that are poor, very poor. They can't grow if they wanted to, and they're not attractive to a lot of the larger entities. So they will be willing to do business with you coming in with your dollars to help them grow very quickly. But a lot of people don't know that because you're not looking at them. You're looking at Atlanta. Right. You're looking at um, Miami. You're looking at Houston. You're looking at Long Beach. Those are already developed. So they already got who they want to play ball with. But these smaller counties want to build those relationships and have something to give you and you have something to give them. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, it make it makes total sense when you think about it yeah. because it's it's nothing happening with it, right? It's, yeah. The, the land is futile, so yeah. like, why not make an opportunity out yes. of it to bring, yes. generate revenue, tax yes. dollars, jobs, yes. and all that. Yeah. You're stimulating the economy. Yeah, you're stimulating the economy, but because we are so um, socially stimulated, you know, uh, we don't. It, they don't got no mile there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they ain't got no club. Where I'ma eat at? You know, but that's where the money is. Right. That's where your resources are. Catch a flight. Right. Catch a plane. Catch a train. Out. Go do what you need to do and come back where you make your money. That's yeah. what I do. Yeah. But that's what stimulates us. And so we miss these opportunities because we're focused on the shiny light. That's what I call it. The shiny light. Got it. We want to be where everybody else at. 
That's why I don't fish in the pond where everybody else fish at. It ain't no fish in there. That's right. Right. That's why it's better and meta. Yes, everything better. <laughs> meta, baby. Come on with it. <laughs> All right, cool. So now you're shifting your focus onto the container storage yeah. business. Yeah. So are you totally letting go of the freight brokerage at this point? Yeah. Are you continuing to run it? What does business look like for you? And we're still we're still like at that part of the story. Yeah, yeah. So pivot into the container storage, get the space, start developing it. Um, once we get everything up and running, um, really that it does not benefit benefit us to be a freight brokerage um, for the type of services that you need to do. So the services that we do are, is called drayage services. Drayage services is essentially the short distance transport of containerized cargo from an ocean port or a rail terminal inland. Okay. Um, and so that sounds like the Webster Dictionary definition. Yeah, that's the hope. <laughs> Hope White Dictionary. <laughs> Play with your mammy. That's my definition. Okay. I'm just saying, it sounded like perfect. It yeah, like, that's even the, like down like inland. Like the yeah. last part of it was like just. That's the Hope White definition. Play with your mammy. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, <laughs> so we started doing trade services as the brokerage. Yep. Um, and oh my God, I think we was making like two dollars on some loads mm. because essentially we figured out that the carrier, the motor carrier has the bulk of the responsibility. Hence, they were going to be charging us out the ass. Got it. Um, and then we were trying to play really hardball with the local carriers. We were very, you know, constant about that. And so we was losing real bad. And so we had to pivot and get a motor carrier's authority to be able to benefit profit-wise and make money. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that was the sole reason from switching from brokerage to motor carry. It had nothing to do with the customers at that time. Okay. It was solely so that we can make money. Okay. Yeah. Because okay. we was losing. Bad. Got it. Mm-hmm. Got it. All right. So continue. Keep All right. On. So, damn. Right. <laughs> you know, you you know, I'm a. You get is it. draining the swamp. <laughs> do you hear me? Good God Almighty! You know, I'm gonna get it. Oh, y'all, y'all been not calling me to drain it. You better go to logistically speaking dot online. That's right. Okay. That's right. That's All right. right. So, um, so we get the motor carriers authority, um, and from there, um, we're now more profitable and we're more marketable for our potential clients to do business because now we're asset based, mm. which is essential when you're doing trade services. You have to be asset based. Okay. Yeah. Brokerage is fine. You get some business, but you won't be constant. You won't be consistent. Right. The bigger boys of the world call me every week because they don't have enough freight. Right. Because that dredge market freight is given to those constants. I can for sure make sure my freight is going to pick up if you're asset based. Got it. Do yeah. you have to have a certain amount of capacity or is it just like well, with dredge, as long as you're asset based? Yeah, that's with dredge is very flexible. You can be one truck, three trucks, 10 trucks or 200 trucks. It's okay. very flexible in that market because the customers are very diverse. Your customer base is very diverse. Okay. And you're dealing with more of the importers, exporters of the world. Got it. But now you're running a, a, a motor carrier authority. So now you're adding assets, trucks, yes. so forth and so yeah. on. But this isn't a business that you really like. I mean, you understand it. I ain't no shit about trucking. But it's a new side to the business. right? I ain't know nothing about so, the. So the, how do we pivot into that? And yeah. So I started learning real quick. And I, instead of me like going to take a whole bunch of classes or like that, I just started asking my drivers, can you help me? Right. Can you help me learn this? And they brought a lot of value to me. And those drivers are still with me. Okay. Um, and so what I did was um, just build out the trucking piece there. So we added one truck, then two trucks, and then three trucks. And then, boom, we get shut down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Ho. I fucked up <laughs> Oh man, you must have done something bad in your, uh, in, your, in, your in your previous life, man. So they, man, you got some karma. What's going right. on with you? What is going I'm on with up you? Again. So uh, we're doing really good, um, and just gun ho to get a business. Yeah. Actually, get an opportunity to do business. I won't say this client's name because I don't want them blowed up. Yeah. Um, not trying to be selfish and thing, but it just would be I, inappropriate. I dig it. Okay, and so got a very. Uh, good contract with this client and uh, the the contract required us to have a hazmat policy um and my insurance provider at the time would only bind us for five thousand dollars per truck per month 
Okay. And I jumped off the cliff with it. Gotcha. And I went from a eighteen hundred dollar month premium to ten thousand dollars with mm. two trucks. Oh wow. Then I want to add a third truck, fifteen thousand dollars. Oh wow. Shit. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, we were doing great business with this client. Um, everything was flowing very smooth. We weren't going to pay a whole lot of bills off. And then, <laughs> boom, the volume dropped. Okay. It shifted. Okay. Nothing to do with us, just the volume. So, But I still got a $15,000 a month payment. Fact. In addition to that, at that same time, I had someone in my office at that time that left 14 boxes in the port mm. and did not tell me. Mm. I didn't have a clue. I was under with this. This was another client. I was under the impression that we had four and we had to get them out. And the client called me while I was in the middle of a class and said, we got to talk. We got to talk right now. I'm sick of the lying. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I'm depending on my operations to manage everything. She says, 14 boxes in the port and y'all got to pay to get them out. And it's 32 vans. Ooh, yes, yes. You got to pay it. And when you get them out. We ain't paying you to deliver. Wow. So, in addition to the 14, we had a total of 22 boxes that we had to deliver from Savannah to Atlanta, totally free of charge. You're talking about $2,200 a box. Hold on. So, those boxes, they, they were on the on the, the containers. They was in the port. Right? They, they were in the port. You guys were contracted to pull them. We had to pay the demerge fees as well as we lost the revenue on delivery. How did that happen? Um, my staff was overwhelmed. We had too much work for the amount of staff I had. At the time, it was just three of us. Got it. And they were overwhelmed. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Just, yeah. just a lot going just, on. Just, and just, just looked at me and said, "Just looked at me and said, I'm so sorry. I didn't think we would get to this point. Wow. No heads up, no nothing. And I just like cringe. I was like, damn, I did it again. When that happens, how does that, well, that, I'm sure that impacted the contract. For yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah. They said, uh, once you deliver these boxes, you're done. We're done. Yeah. It's a wrap. Part is over. I'm going to holler at y'all. And I couldn't say, hey, I didn't do this. Right. Because you, know, you did. It's still your business. <laughs> it's, it's we. Right. It's, it ain't no I. It's always a we. It's yeah, we. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I couldn't say they were having a bad day or they were having a bad moment. I had to say, I'm so sorry. You know, I apologize. Like, And they they were like very stonewalled. It was like we were very unprofessional and this and this and that. It was so embarrassing because I was like, damn, I'm here again. Wow. Yeah. So what happens next? So I had just started HD Dredge and Container Services. It was actually June of 2021. Yeah. And so this company had been dormant. Like I just had it. And the reason why I had it was because when I got the $5,000 a month hazmat policy, my insurance company told me if I wanted to add more drivers without it being $15,000 a month. I had to get another MC. Got it. So I created a new MC in my maiden name, Hope Allen, and I had HC White Logistics in Hope White, and so that's how I was able to get two DOTs. But okay. I wasn't doing anything with the company. Right. Well, shit. Now I gotta do something with the company because <laughs> I got bills to pay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I um, everything with HD White Logistics I just canceled out. Um, except for my business license and then on the MC side and then I just started doing business with HD Dredge. Okay. Mm-hmm. Got it. But I didn't move any contracts or move anything. I kind of like lost everything right there. All of, everything went away right there together. So the the customers we were doing business with stopped. Um, the containers we had, we moved them in. I was like done, but I was only done for like two weeks because I immediately got back on my hustle and started making calls mm. to like resources to people I had met. And I was like, look, I need some help. I need some extra work, this, this, and that. And then they started funding me more work with HD Dredge, and that's how we got back started. Gotcha. So with HD Dredge, now, so how many trucks are you moving at this point? Seven trucks, seven drops. Seven trucks. Now, with your trucks, do you? On them outright, you finance them? No, I have all owner operators. Okay. 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 Gotcha. We're not going to tell all my Kool Aid on this show. <laughs> I'm getting all the, I'm getting all for y'all, man. Man, y'all better appreciate me. We you not, better, you better protect not. Ron Mel at all we costs. Tell it. <laughs> we tell it. Good God. I have seven trucks, seven drivers, all owner operators. All owner operators. Uh huh. Yeah, we had a company truck. That was part of the debt, too. Yeah. Oh, good leasing company here got us. Yeah. Twenty thousand dollars. Gotcha. Two months. Hell no. Never again. <laughs> Fuel card bill up the wazoo. Yeah. No, nah, I'm not doing that. 
Got you. So with those, because um, you do, you guys pretty much do kind of short moves, right? Like Yeah, short distance transport. The farthest radius we'll go out is probably 350 miles one way. 350 miles. So you guys are pretty much home every day. Every day, yes. And how's the pay for that? Um. So, damn. You really, <laughs> that was one of them brain stalls again. I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> Damn. Um, our guys, our own operators do fairly well. Yeah. Um, fairly well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. You can give <laughs> Damn. My payroll is high. So, so I guess my question is, what's a, what's let, let, give me a range of what you can make on a on a three hundred mile under three hundred mile radius, and I'm sure there's different moves, but like around what are they paying? For if these you're moves? consistent mm-hmm. in my market as an owner operator. On average, you should be about sixty five hundred a week. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you and are, how much moves are you doing to like make that? Five to six days a week, so you're probably doing about five to six moves. So one a, one a day. Mm-hmm. Okay. One a day. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. Got it. All right. And and if you are <laughs> a four day person, yeah, you're at about forty five. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So so now, how many different contracts are you are you running? Three. 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 Okay. Um, um, the big orange bucket. Okay. Home Depot. Gotta gotta love them. Yeah. Um, we have a stone client, um, uh, Granite Stone client out of Brazil. Very good friends. Very close. Um, and then we also have a paint product and manufacturing distributor. Did they find you or did you find them? Um, all three found me. How? Um. Well. Well. Sorry. Two found me. One I begged for. <laughs> okay. I begged. <laughs> and I cried. And I begged some more. And they gave me an opportunity and we rocked it. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. The other ones that found you, how do you market yourself uh to be found? The, the others that found me came through um relationships that I had built from being at these conferences. Um really? and people who I had met recommended me to these clients. Okay. Um one is a very large entity that were recommended me to the stone client. And so we've been with the Stone client now for a while. Okay. Um, and then the second one came from a local um, network, Georgia Grown, which I always tell people about these local associations and in, in, in uh, state associations. Georgia Grown is a marketing agricultural initiative through the state of Georgia f- to get farmers out there, like get their products out there and get them visible. And it's also a resource to suppliers for those farmers. So like if you want to move cotton or peanuts or peaches or chicken or whatever, Georgia Grown will be an association you want to be a part of. Got it. But you got to participate in events. Okay. What are some of the biggest challenges with this type of work on a regular daily Cash operational flow. Cash flow. Can you explain I that? need some money. <laughs> get, it, get into that. I don't sleep. <laughs> Shoot. Get it, why? why? Talk, talk about cash flow issues. So everybody always says, I don't have work. That's not our problem. We have work. We don't have the money. So keeping the money turning as fast as you can do the work and complete the work is the challenge here. Mm. Um, in Dredge and in International Freight, there are so many different variables and so many different people in play to make sure you get paid. The information has to be at a certain location before your invoice is paid. And so you may submit your invoice timely, but your customer may not have a final piece of the invoice from the steamship line or the agent or whatever, and then your invoice won't get paid. And so that leads to delays. And so you may be on a net 15 or net 30 payment term, but essentially for your client, it's net 60. Mm. So how do you, how do you? You did that work 60 days ago. Right. You pray. <laughs> <laughs> you pray your way through. No, seriously, you lean to resources like TBS factoring Factor. or OTR solutions. Got it. Yeah. You plugged OTR. Look at that. The, the family. Our, our family. I love Grace. That's, Grace yeah. is good people. Yeah, she's good people. For sure. Yeah. So factoring is definitely needed in your business. Yes. To keep cash flow going. Yes. The fact for Dre's. For, yes. for Dre's. Yes. It, Dreage is very capital intensive. Um, it's not necessarily just the cash flow to be able to pay your people, but the maintenance issues and concerns that come up with it. So being that containers move so much, they move on a, what's called a chassis. And so those chassis are oftentimes, if you don't have your own, you're not maintaining your own chassis, you get them from a pool. 
pool chassis is everybody and their mama get to touch them. Right. Okay. And so the tires that they put back on the chassis are called recaps. So it's basically like a layer of glue and a piece of rubber. Right. And another layer of glue and a piece of rubber. Right. And so with so much going, that comes apart and you, you blow tires. Well, those tires are between $400 to $600 to $700 a pop. And you have to pay it. Right. And you're not reimbursed. Right. Because it's always driver's error. <laughs> <laughs> it's always driver's error got it so yeah that can drain the swamp essentially the other thing with doing containers is that you have to have somewhere to house your containers so a storage yard or slots um depending on which area you're in like i'm in coastal georgia the ground is extremely soft so when it rains the containers go in the ground Guess mm. what? I got to call a record service to come out there and pull it out the ground. And that's anywhere from 250 to $600 a pool. How often does that happen? Um, for me, about twice a week. Really? Yes. Yes. And I'm right now we're doing about four to five tires a week. Wow. Yeah. So you, you rent all your chassis? Uh, we pull out the pool. Okay. Uh huh. You pull out the pool. Chassis pool, and so, and the so you don't have you don't own any chassis. No, no. <clears throat> and the reason why is because most of our accounts now, or the volume of our account is dropping hook, and so we need our chassis, and gotcha. so it would be more beneficial to get out of the pool than us having ours. Got it. Yeah. So that um that uh, record that that has that's like an exorbitant cost, man. Like yes. Have you ever thought about? Figuring out a way to offset that, maybe uh, you might as well get your own record. <laughs> yeah, so I actually did look at one of those trucks, yeah. and it's like, uh, I think he told me $1 million yeah, they, for the type of truck to pull it up. Yeah. yeah, it's very expensive. Um, I've also looked into getting a small crane for the site to be able to lift the boxes up. Um, the challenge is, you know, having a skilled person, trained person right, there to, to be able to it. do that. Because I ain't finna get out there and be lifting no boxes up out of the ground. Yeah. Um, but it's something that we commonly face. Is there um, any, is, there's no, no, no way around it, right? There's no, there's no way around it. The other issue that we face is uh, broken glad hands uh, on the front of the trailers, on yeah. the front of the chassis. Yeah. Um, for our particular client, we're responsible for replacing those glad hands before they actually get them to the dock to unload those trailers. So we have to constantly send a vendor out to the DCs to have these glad, glad hands fixed before they actually get the trailers in the doors. Right. So these costs probably represent a, a, a lot, like on yeah. your bottom line. Yeah, like you have it, to kind of account for this. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm big boy price yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah. I probably... Yeah, some of my debtors would be like, so you should have paid me instead of paying them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. So what's going on now on the storage side? Um, on the storage side, I probably have um, two chassis, one dry van, and two containers. Four okay. containers on my yard. Gotcha. Um, we haven't done long-term storage now for a while. Um, all of our clients, every last one of them are requesting immediate movement of their freight. They want the freight immediately pulled immediately offload it and back into the port. Um, our average dwell time on boxes used to be, about four months ago, um, seven to 21 days. That means we had opportunity to store or either it sat on the customer's yard. Now that looks like a 72 hour turnaround, freight is out and then come pick this box up and take it back to the port. Mm. Yeah. Do you know what changed? Um, yeah, um, the demand change. Um, first, first and foremost, customers are tired of paying all these damn fees for, it's just an asinine charge for sitting there letting the freight store when I could just put it in, in skew right. and stop. And so customers are getting their freight out in, in order so that customers can get their freight. Um, that's the first thing. And then second thing is the demand has shifted. Everybody went back to work. And so things are dropping. Got it. Mm -hmm. So as a business person, how are you uh, adjusting? Adjusting. With, so the storage piece doesn't really affect us. Us having the land is just pretty green grass right. out there. Right. You know, um, right now we just work on developing of that land, development of that land right now in preparation for other services we're going to move to, which we can talk about. Um, but for us, it's more about the trucking services now. So we beefed up the trucking services and how much more capacity we can handle. 
Got you. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about it. You made a little segue. What are some other plans for that space that you're thinking about in the um, future? Yeah, so we definitely want to have our own warehousing and cross-docking facility. We currently lease a space now. It's about 5,000 square feet. Okay. Um, but we essentially want to have our own uh, 50,000 square foot cross-docking facility on our land. So you're going to build on it? Yeah. Okay. How long, how long does a, something like that take? Um, it would take about two years. Okay, mm-hmm. and you know how much money that project would six cost? Six million dollars. Six million. Well, dollars. it's six million dollars to concrete the ten and a half acres and to build on the twenty four acres. Okay, it is four point three million, so ten million dollars total. Okay, mm-hmm. okay, that's a pretty uh, yeah, that's pretty big. heavy lift. Yeah, I'm about to get an OnlyFans. <laughs> <laughs> Cause baby, who? <laughs> so <laughs> these investors ain't lining up, baby. So, so sure. when you when you go into a project like that and start considering something like that, what's the first things you're looking at? You're trying to find the resources where the where the money's at, right? Yeah, find where the money is, and before we just like focus on the money. Actually, now in my market, resources are becoming a problem. Aggregate rock. Because there are so many warehouses that are coming up so quickly in my market that we are very low on rock. Mm. And so the distance by which we need to quote and get rock from now, the cost of the trucking almost is the same price as putting the rock or doing the concrete itself. Oh, wow. I'm serious. Wow. Yeah. The the cost of the trucking to truck that that amount of rock that we need in is like $3 million. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a whole lot of moving factors. So we're going to be in that grass for a long time. Yeah, it's a, it's a process. Yeah. It's yeah. a process. Yeah. How big is your team now? Oh, so we have 13 staff, seven trucks, seven drivers, so 20. So the, the, the 13, what are they, what's like, what are they doing operationally? So we have five operations managers, uh, four coordinators and AR and AP and payroll. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Got it. Mm-hmm. Um, you've been in business for a while now. Mm-hmm. You've learned a lot. You've yeah. had some ups and you've had some downs. Yeah. What, what have you, um, what, what is your takeaway from your journey? If you, if you could kind of, you know, kind of bundle it all into one thought. What's your, what's your biggest takeaway from everything that you've been through? Um, definitely being emotionally sound. Um, and balanced um, and having a good foundation under yourself not you know we lean to our family and friends but you being secure in who you are um, has been probably the biggest takeaway for me and understanding how to stay balanced like what do you need to do that is that therapy is that alone time what does that look like yeah prayer meditation whatever it is that you do what does that look like for you right Mm -hmm. right because Entrepreneurship is hard. Oh man. yeah, this this shit ain't this ain't <laughs> for the the meek. You know, this is really really difficult. And you know, again, the focus is always the money, but you should also be focused on your mental health because it will deteriorate if you only focus on the money. Because there's so many circumstances that come at you in logistics that are beyond your control. Yeah. And so one of my good friends, Saritha of SJW Logistics, she hit it on the head when she said, if you are a control freak, logistics is not the business for you Mm. because it will make you lose yourself. So having a sense of balance has probably been one of the biggest things I would say you need to have coming in. Yeah. Like always being able to go back to what we call in yoga, one, center. Your your yeah. center. Your center. Yeah, I think that I think that's the same in just all business, not just log- logistics. Like yeah. you have to be able to rely on people, be able to mm-hmm. allocate. Yeah, you can't do it all on your yeah, own. Yeah, can't do it all. You can't be a solopreneur. That's the other thing. Um, when you start in a logistics business, we we plan to make the money, but we don't plan for the growth. So I my I'm telling people now, like as soon as you get your first customer, before you make your first dollar, you need to have somebody in place to help you grow. Yeah. Yeah. Like, don't say, oh, well, I can't afford it. Yes, you can. You can't afford not to. Yeah. Because you'll get bogged down. Got it. Mm-hmm. Mentorship. Mentorship. You're a mentor mm-hmm. to, yeah. to people. I'd, I'd be remiss not to mention it. You have tons of students that <laughs> that love you and yeah, that um, good, that good. you've been cultivating over the years. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I'm real quiet about my mentorship. <laughs> <laughs> but I have been mentoring now since 2018. Um, I do very well with it. Um, I have a very good 
um, crew of, of they've become like friends now, a lot of them. Um, they're very successful. Um, a lot of them have direct contracts. Um, and so we do very well. But my mentorship is really personally based um, because I found that when I first got started, I needed some hand holding. And I am very consistent in hand holding. So a lot of my mentorship, uh, my mentorship um, is con- consistent communication, right? Guidance. Uh, I provide my students customers. A lot of them have partnered with me on my contracts, so they've made money, uh, a lot of money. Uh, they their investment has been multiplied maybe ten times over, uh, very very quickly. Right. Um, and the other thing is, I don't just work with them, but I work with their teams. So just because you come take my mentorship doesn't mean that I won't help your team. Yeah. That's very important because I'm helping the company, not just you personally. Got it. Um, but our mentorship um, is um, probably one of the only programs out there that I know of. Now, there may be some, but we offer one week in office shadow to come to our facility. You work with myself and my team. If you have trucks, we'll send you into the port so that you can get that hands-on experience. Um, and then uh, from there, it lasts 12 months, where from there I would just be doing like weekly or monthly check-in calls. It's up to you. And we just kind of help you grow from there. Like, so helping you understand your marketing, uh, how to bid, your systems, uh, your accounting software, telling which banks are good for you to do business with, um, understanding your factoring, how to do your invoices in Android, which is very different than doing invoices in OTR. Right. Um, understanding your pricing and quoting, which is really big now. Where do your numbers come from? What's your cost to do business? how to get equipment, how to manage that equipment, what does maintenance look like. And now my biggest thing that I'm really hitting on is insurance claims. Mm. Because so many people are getting into Dre's, they're not understanding the liability and the risk associated with it. So I want new carriers and new partners in my mentorship program to really understand how to protect yourself and structure yourself. Got it. Is there any examples you can kind of give us of uh, insurance claims or issues that maybe could have went another way had somebody had the proper protection or yeah, so forth. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um I just just happened um yes uh Tuesday with one of my mentees. Um he was another one. He's a very good guy. Um uh, but he was gun how to make the money, okay? And so he gets caught up on just getting his boxes pulled. And so he'll pull whoever. John John come pull his box. He, they did not take the time to get John John's information. And so as a result, Tuesday, John John had a wreck and flipped the reefer. Mm. There was not a certificate holder on, on file or neither was the company additionally insured to his company. And so he financially ate a $7,500 tow bill. Mm. And we are still don't know if he's going to eat the damage that occurred to the reefer container and the reefer unit itself. Right. But the guy who was driving the truck is completely off the hook. Right. But if he had followed process, which is adding that company, having that company add him as additional insured on their insurance, that tow bill could have possibly been covered as well as the damage to that reefing unit had they had the proper endorsements. Gotcha. Yeah. So gotcha. having that contractual agreement with his subcontractors in place to legally and financially protect himself would have helped him out greatly. But now he's going to eat a $7,500 bill. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah. That definitely sucks. Yeah. What do you enjoy doing outside of work? Um, I don't know if I should say this because <laughs> I'm newly single and I want to run nobody off. But I'm into guns. In the guns. I just bought an AR-15. Yeah. Yes, and I am kind of leery of how I'm gonna learn how to shoot this thing because <laughs> I, I can't go to everybody around me, the area that I'm in. Right. right I can't right. just go ask as a black woman to go shoot an <laughs> AR-15. So. <laughs> Hey, I got this new AR. Yeah, yeah. So I gotta find me a crew, right? Um, to shoot with. Okay. Um, but um, I've got like four pistols now. Okay. Um, and AR-15, and I want a shotgun. So I like to shoot. Um, and then I also love spending time with my children. I am a mama, 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 mama. So we beaching it up, festivaling it up. Uh, we're going to the museum. Um, movies, just like really, really mom stuff. Yeah. I'm into that. And then lastly, is fishing. Fishing? 
country girl. Yeah, some pretty cool hobbies, man. That's not that's that's a nice little assortment. Yeah, I love the fish now. Like freshwater fish. Okay. I ain't getting on nobody boats. Gotcha. Okay. So you gotta be off like the side of like a, a, a Oh, pier I get or in I get like in the pond, or... but I ain't going in the ocean. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's too much water to drink. Yeah. Yeah. I feel you. I yeah. like to eat fish, but I I don't fish. Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. So I like freshwater fishing. Um, that's what I do in my pastime. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Um, man, I think we talked about everything. Yeah, we didn't talk about everything. Did I miss anything? Uh no. You sure? Damn. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, um, do you want to plug my show or no? Of course I want to plug your show. Okay, plug my show. Let's plug your show. So Talk I, about your, I heard you have a show, Hope. Yeah, so I have a show. <laughs> uh, my show is No Bullshipping with Hope White. Okay. It airs on the Let's Talk Supply Chain platform with Sarah Bonds Humphrey. It's every fourth Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And what do you guys talk about? Uh, we are, are all inclusive to everything shipping. So we talk about warehousing, uh, drayage services, and I really like to pull on a lot of resources that support the drayage in industry. So insurance companies, real estate investors, um, and then other entities that are in the drayage space and what they're doing and how they're doing it. Got it. Yeah. Women are killing it in logistics. Absolutely. What's going on? Tell, what, what's, what's your thoughts about that? So women are the rulers of the world. Facts. Okay, facts. Um, I think that the world is now realizing just how organized and structured women are and how um, important we are in those spaces. Our voice matters. Um, and so um, it's just making it that much easier for us to be in those top places. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One of the most powerful moments of Freight Fest, I would say for sure, mm-hmm. was when you, Shaquana Teasley, Melanie Patterson. Yep. Yeah, like. Y'all were like the bulls, yeah. man. Y'all just came up yeah. and just killed it. Absolutely. And everybody was just so moved yeah. by those three presentations yeah. back to back. It Absolutely. was like, wow. Yeah, yeah. Y'all and, came through and just shut it down. And then it's important to highlight that these are three black women. Yes. That's moving in this space yes. in logistics and supply chain. And I'm going to say it. This is a white boy dominant world. Right. I don't sugarcoat it no more with them when I talk about it. And for us to be moving the way that we're moving in these spaces is truly phenomenal. Yeah. It's is not to be um, intimidating to any males that are in the space, black or white, but it's just more so to be empowering, uplifting. And so, if you got a strong black sister around you and she know her shit, push her up. That's right. Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing time in in this industry, man. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, it's beautiful to watch it. You absolutely. Know, watch it uh, come to fruition yeah. and just happen. Yeah. Because it's changing. It's changing. It's you know, changing. It's a lot of black women. I wish. You know, the ones that are really killing it, that they find their voice and they stand up and say, hey, I'm here. I'm doing it because we see we're going to change the face of what this industry looks like. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. All right. Well, um, you know, you've been here two other times before. Yeah. So, you know, you can't leave without giving your final thought. Oh, gosh. And um, I think everybody may know where to connect with you but you have some new new viewers here so let people know where they can find you yeah where they can learn more about you know everything that you're doing yeah and then lastly i oh, love you want to talk about my I socks love the, i love the socks and the sneakers yeah the socks even to fire yeah so my sneakers came from darkest lane okay look at and the my plug socks, dark is about to get darkest right lane now. yep darkest Shout lane darkest that's my homeboy yeah yep. and then my socks came from the sock store and they're King Jaffe Jaffer Fire Of coming to America I love that Yeah love Cause I'm that. on my royalty shit now I, I can see Yeah You ain't playing I ain't playing <laughs> <laughs> I'm on my royalty shit you, you ain't playing Yeah but your viewers can find me on IG At HD Dredge um, Or Logistically Speaking Online um, And we also have websites www.hddredge.com Or www.logisticallyspeaking.online Okay mm-hmm. And then lastly The final thought What do you want to leave them with? Ooh, this is big. Think, 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 big. Think, think hard about it. Big. Because you don't gave some other final thoughts. They've been fired. Oh, we need, we need to top the other, the other two. I feel like Jilly from Philly. <laughs> All right. So seriously, <laughs> seriously. Yeah, Yo, you, you crazy. All right, you I know crazy. I'm crazy. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, I know everyone says this, but since COVID, you know, everybody came into the trucking business full force. Went and bought all these trucks. You may have even acquired a warehouse space. You just went out here and just jumped off the cliff, you know, and now the market has shifted, okay? 
don't get discouraged if this is truly your passion and your goal for your family or for yourself. Stay consistent, find the knowledge, make sure your mentorship is a reflection of where you're trying to be. Make sure your mentorship and your guidance is a source that really truly is gonna help your business grow. Mm. When you're doing that, remember to stay your authentic self. Do not take on the face of your mentor. Do you, because your success lies in who you are and what your vision is as a company. Yeah. And stay the course. That was hard. Yeah. I feel like that was like like scripted. Like you was, that, that, was that Jerry Springer Springer's final thought? That, that was fire. I like I was, that. I was being sincere. I know you were. Yeah. I'm, I know you were. I'm serious. I, I, I felt that. I think that my success has come from, and I know it has come from me being my authentic self. Yeah. And I want to project that on people that it is truly you and your company's vision that propels you to success. And I think in this industry, people are definitely afraid to be themselves. No, be yourself. Right? Be yourself. But this industry is full of people that are themselves. Yes. Unapologetically. Unapologetically. And once you get in it, you're going to realize that. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. All the successful companies, the larger companies, are themselves. Yeah. And now we're one of them. That's right. Yeah. Hope White. Hope it's White. It's always amazing when we get together awesome. and, and, and talk. Awesome. Yeah. We always run it up. I think there's going to be another one that the people enjoy. Oh, God. Um, so we're going to have to do it again soon. Sure. I'm always open. For sure. Yeah. Uh, Hustle fam, if you can't respect that, your whole perspective is whack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you smell something burning, it's only your desire. Yeah. Myself, Hope, HD Dredge, the whole family, we out. If you twisted, confused, or stuck about trucks, don't be dumb. This is the place to come. Truck and hustle. Let's go.